Revelation chapter 7 is our text for tonight, and a lot more positive picture tonight than the blood and guts we saw last time. So, We saw the uh, first four seals of the book opened, or the first uh, six seals, excuse me, uh, opened uh, last time, and uh, as the seals are open, God is unleashing His judgment against the wicked, whom we have identified as the Roman Empire, and we'll continue to do so as we study the book. We have in chapter 7 something that is actually quite common, uh, and we're going to see it again in the book before we're done, and that is an interlude. So we have a series of six, a pause, and then the seventh seal does not come until chapter 8. So we'll look at uh, Revelation chapter 7 this evening, the interlude be between 6 and 7. Uh, and usually uh, these interludes... They really don't have any deep theological meaning. Uh, it is simply a dramatic pause. And remember what we said as we introduced the book, that you have to read the book of Revelation with your imagination. And so here we see this order of things, these six things coming out like six shots out of a cannon, destruction coming against the wicked, and then you're waiting because you've heard that there are seven of these, but you don't get number seven right after six. You have to wait for it. And as you wait for it, there is this tremendously comforting scene in seven. And so it kind of balances the destruction that we see in chapter six with this uh, scene of encouragement in chapter seven. Uh, and there are other roots uh, for this within the book as well. Remember back in chapter three and in verse 10, the Lord said to Philadelphia, because you've kept the word of my perseverance, I will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour that is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Well, how the Lord is going to do that, in a sense how, not physically on the earth how, but uh, the sense in which He's going to do that will be the subject of chapter 7 this evening. And we heard also in chapter 6 and in verse 17 the great day of their wrath has come. Who is able to stand? We're going to see in verse 9 a group who are standing. And so who is able to stand? It's these people that are mentioned in chapter 7. So there is quite a connection going on here. It's not at all haphazard. And what we find in chapter 7 is that uh, simply God's people are going to be sealed for their protection. And the question is sometimes raised about the order of events. The question is sometimes raised, well, shouldn't have this have happened first? And some people uh, think that the events of this chapter actually precede the unleashing of the forces uh, in the uh, first eight verses, that this is actually something that happened first. But it seems to me that that's kind of the wrong approach, to say, well, did this happen first, or why did God unleash his terror, and then protect them. It's part of a big scene, and I think that's the way to understand it. And if you want to think that, well, this happened first, that this is kind of a flashback to an earlier time, that's fine. If you want to think of it as going on at the same time, that while God is judging the earth, that he is protecting his people, that works as well. Uh, it's not chronological. It's not that this happens and then this happens, that it is this picture that is being painted. And think about it in terms of a canvas. You know, if you watch an artist paint a picture, and you say, well, why did you paint that part and then this part? It doesn't matter. It's the picture, the, the finished product that's done. And that's what we see here. Uh, this ceiling might seem at an odd place to us, but it's the picture that is important for us to see, and there needs... Uh, to not be any necessarily strictly chronological accounting of this. So in chapter 7 and verse 1, after this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. And so here we have an image of destructive powers. These winds uh, are apparently, again, a symbol for God's destructive force. And some have taken the idea that maybe these four winds are the first 
four seals, uh, the, the four horsemen that we saw in verses 1 through 8. It's possible, uh, if you want to take the idea that this is what happened first, that before these first four forces were unleashed that God did that, fine. But it's, again, the big picture that we want to keep in mind here. And like everything else in the book, John is here uh, counting on a passage from the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 6 and verse 5, uh, a verse that we noted in our study last week that is the source of this imagery for the different horses and their different colors. The angel replied to me, These are the four spirits of heaven going forth after standing before the Lord of all the earth, with one of which the black horses are going forth to the north country. And remember, there are different horses that come out, and they go through the earth to do the bidding of God and to destroy uh, his enemies. Well, John has this picture rooted there as well. Uh, Jeremiah picks up on this as well. Jeremiah 49, 36. I will bring upon the nation of Elam the four winds from the four ends of heaven and will scatter them to all these winds, and there will be no nation to which the outcasts of Elam will not go. And, uh, of course, the ancients were familiar with destructive winds. Uh, they had bad weather just like we do. And so this idea of the God's power being unleashed and here first held back as messengers of God's destruction uh, is not anything unusual. Uh, interestingly enough also, Exodus 10.13, that the Bible says that it was a wind that brought the eighth plague on Egypt. And so this idea that when, the, when God sends his wind, that destruction comes with it, is rooted all the way back in Exodus. And I want you to keep your eye open for that because there is just a ton of imagery from the Exodus in the book of Revelation. There are just all kinds of little echoes and hints and references to the, the plagues on Egypt, and this is probably uh, one of them as well. So if you're familiar with the Old Testament uh, way that God has of speaking about judging evil nations, uh, the appearance of these winds is not all that uh, mysterious. It says in verse 2 that I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun. Uh, that, of course, is a clue to what this angel does and who he is. In Ezekiel 43, verses 2 and 4, Behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the way of the east, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. And, and by the way, whenever you hear that in the Bible, that God's voice was like the sound of many waters, or that it was like thunder, it's not a good thing. Somebody's in real trouble when God is described like that. The earth shone with his glory, and the glory of the Lord came into the house by way of the gate facing toward the east. The east is, of course, the direction that is associated with God and not just with God, but with God's coming. That, that's the direction from which he comes to judge. Just like the sun rises and scorches whatever it shines on, so God rises and judges. Uh, in perhaps a little bit different context, but not without significance, you remember in Matthew chapter 2 that the wise men came because they saw his star, where? Rising in the east, yeah. Um, and so they took that as part of the clue that God was up to something, this sign from the east. So when we are told here that there is an angel ascending from the rising of the sun or from the east, we are to understand that he is a divine, uh, or not a divine, but a divinely appointed agent of God's destruction. And he has not come, however, to destroy, verse 2. He has, we are told, the seal of God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth and the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of God on their foreheads. Uh, this idea of sealing can mean a couple different things. And there's probably overlap of these things in this particular text. 
Uh, one thing that you do with a seal is you use it to mark what is yours. And that was a use of seals in ancient times, as well as what we find here as well. In uh, Revelation 14, in verse 1, we have here uh, in not only a seal, but it says that I saw the Lamb standing on Zion with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. And we are familiar with the idea that you write your name on what is yours. You write your name on the cover of a book or on, some of you write your name on your laundry so somebody doesn't get it, uh, but you write your name on it to show that it's yours. Well, God writes his name on them, or here in chapter 7, he seals them. Verse 4, um, these have been purchased from uh, among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Uh, these are the one who follows the Lamb wherever he goes and so forth. Uh, and so uh, these are the can be identified as the people that belong to God. But we're also familiar with the fact that a seal is not just a thing that says this is mine, but that it has authority to it. And that you would use a seal to indicate that something has been authenticated or validated. When the king would sign his name to the law, he would do so with his seal, his signet ring. And the seal mark of the king indicated that it really was valid. And there may be some of that here as well to, to validate their status as the people of God, to identify them that they really are God's people, and there should be no doubt about that. Uh, we've also noted uh, just a little bit that the seal is associated with God's name, Revelation 14.1, but also some other passages in the New Testament, uh, 2 Timothy 2.19, I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, and again in Revelation 13. Uh, somebody go to Revelation 13, 17 and read that for us, if you would. Who's got that? <clears throat> Jeremy, go ahead. And he provides that no one should be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. So there is another mark we're going to see, and uh, that mark is going to indicate... Uh, that he belongs to the beast, and you'll notice that it is said there uh, that he has uh, the the name or the number. We'll come to that passage later. And then, of course, in 14, 9 through 11, if anyone worships the beast and has his image, receives a mark on his forehead or his hand, uh, so that same kind of idea of marking uh, with a name. Uh, we get that in the Old Testament. In Exodus 28, 11 through 21, we have the instructions there for making the breastplate that the high priest wore. And it says in verse 36, as part of that instruction, that you shall make a plate of pure gold and shall engrave on it like the engravings of a seal, holy to the Lord. And if I'm remembering that context correctly, that is the plate that the high priest wore across his forehead. So across his forehead was a little gold plate that said, Holy to the Lord, and it was written like you would write a seal. And so uh, this idea of, of having on you something that indicates that you are God's people uh, is quite common. Of course, it's figurative uh, in our context here and in 2 Timothy 2.19. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having this seal the Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. So again, this idea of the Lord knowing their name, them knowing the Lord's name, that is the seal, Paul says, that marks them as the people of God. And so the seal here in Revelation 7, verses 2 and 3, is not some literal mark. You know, there's a lot of uh, talk all the time about what is the mark of the beast and is it a barcode that the government's going to print on our arms or, or no it's nothing like that and this seal here is not some mark in your flesh it is a symbol that God knows who you are that he knows that you are his and you know that he is uh, your God and he recognizes his people uh, in Ezekiel 9 Verses 4 and following, we have another background to this. The Lord said to him, to this uh, servant of his that is standing there, 
go through the midst of the city, even through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations which are being committed in its midst. But to the others he said in my hearing, go through the city after him and strike. Do not let your eye have pity and do not spare. Utterly slay old men, young men, maidens, little children, and women, but do not touch any man on whom is the mark, and you shall start from my sanctuary. It is very clear from Ezekiel 9 what this mark is for, what this forehead symbol is for. It is to indicate that these people belong to God and they are to be spared from God's wrath and his destruction. And this probably goes back to another story that might even be more familiar. Can you think of another story where God had somebody mark something so he wouldn't hurt them? The Passover, yeah. So this is a common idea, actually, in, in several texts, and we find it uh, here as well. And, of course, the ancients were familiar with this idea. This is a, uh, a seal impression of King Ahaz. Uh, this is what some we've seen before, the seal of Jeroboam's servant that has the lion on it. This is the seal of Hosea's servant, King Hosea of Israel, the last king of Israel. And so seals were a very common thing in the Old Testament as well as in the Roman Empire. And I think the early Christians would have understood very clearly uh, the idea here. So they're going to be marked for protection. And the next scene we see, therefore, in verses 4 through 8, is the people who are going to be protected. I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And then we have in verses 5 through 8 a list of the tribes from which they come, and there are 12,000 from every tribe. However, if you are familiar with tribe lists in the Old Testament, and you read this one, this one will look a little bit weird to you. Uh, first of all, Judah comes first on the list. And when you read the uh, genealogies and the lists of the sons of Jacob in the Old Testament, rarely does Judah ever come first on the list. But here he comes first, and probably because this is the tribe of the lion. Uh, remember, we saw in chapter 5, the Lion of Judah, the Lamb of God. It is the Lamb that has now been opening uh, these seals. And in Genesis 49.10 is the source of all of that imagery. Remember, uh, Jacob said concerning his children that Judah is a lion's whelp. And so the Lion is the symbol of Judah. Paul says in Romans 1.5 that uh, Jesus is the descendant of David from Judah. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, we won't spend much time with this, but in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, we do have a list there of the sons of Israel. And I want you to just notice the first thing we're told about them. 1223, these are the numbers of the divisions equipped for war who came to David at Hebron to turn the kingdom of Saul to him according to the word of the Lord, first name on the list, the sons of Judah. So uh, this list seems to have been influenced by Genesis 49 and the prophecy of the prominence of Judah and, of course, the throne of David. So we see in the Old Testament there is this kind of rising star of Judah. Uh, and you'll notice also uh, that there are some inclusions on this list and some uh, that are not included. Uh, before we leave Ezekiel 37, we have another list where it is just kind of boiled down to the bare essentials and the other tribes seem to have been subsumed into Judah. But even past that, uh, the tribe of Dan does not appear on this list, even though he is one of the children of Israel. And that is probably, I well, can't say for sure, but probably because he is associated with idolatry. Remember, that the golden calves were at Dan and Bethel. Uh, Jews, that is to say the rabbis of the first century, believed that this, the tribe of Dan would be the source of one they called the Antichrist. Now, how pertinent that is to the book of Revelation, I'll let you decide, but it's interesting that there is this Jewish view that Dan shouldn't be included for its wickedness. 
And uh, Ephraim uh, is also not on the list because Ephraim was also associated with idolatry in the Old Testament as well. So it's not your standard list of the 12 tribes. And it's not so much a question, I think, of who's on it and who's not and why and why are they in the order they're in, although that might be interesting reading and, and study. Uh, there's a purpose, a bigger purpose here. We have a list and a number, a number list, a census, as it were. And the significance of that is that this is a military image. In the Old Testament, the reason you would count the number of people you've got is to determine how big your army is. And in the Old Testament, whenever God would number Israel, he would number the males age 20 and older, that is, the males who are of fighting age. Well, that's kind of what we have here in Revelation as well. Revelation 14.4, uh, we have uh, those who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. That's language taken from the censuses of the Old Testament. And there's another indication that we're supposed to understand this list as a military group. Uh, in 714, it says that these are the ones who have washed their robes. And we find in the Old Testament that that is exactly what the males were supposed to do after a battle. Numbers 31 after a battle, you camp outside the camp seven days. Whoever's killed any person who has ever touched any slain, purify yourselves. You shall purify for yourselves every garment, every article of leather, the work of goat's hair, the articles of wood, and you shall wash your clothes on the seventh day and be clean, and afterwards you can enter the camp. These are the ones who have washed their robes, which is another indication, therefore, that what we are seeing here is not just any old list of people, but God's army. Uh, consider Isaiah 11, verses 12 through 14. He will lift up a standard for the nations, assemble the banished ones of Israel, will gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. They will swoop down on the slopes of the Philistines on the west. Together they will plunder the sons of the east. So here we have this idea of the standard assembling the nation, uh, assembling Israel, calling them together for the purpose of warfare. And, of course, this is a messianic picture, how they will be gathered together to be victorious over the, their proverbial foes, Edom and Moab. Uh, another passage to consider, Micah 5, 6 through 9. Uh, and notice here, the remnant of Jacob will be among the nations, among many peoples, like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among the flocks. And if he passes through, he tramples down and tears, and there is none to rescue. Your hand will be lifted up against your adversaries. Your enemies will be cut off. So here again, we have Israel, the Messianic Israel, depicted as a fighting group. And what's interesting about the text in Micah is that they are associated with a lion, which is exactly the kind of association we have here. So my understanding is that this list of tribes is a list of God's people described as an army. There are 12,000 from each tribe, and the symbolism works out to be 12 times 12, times 10 times 10 times 10. I got that right, didn't I? Okay. My math is always suspect. Uh -uh. 12 times 12, two 12s. Uh, and I, this is the kind of analysis that I'm not real fond of because it seems to be microanalysis. But the fact that there are two 12s here might suggest all of God's people, those from the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, 12 being the number of Israel, and then three tens, ten being the number of fullness, three being the number for God. If that is the way to understand this number, and it seems to me that it is, that might be the significance. So who are these people? Uh, the number itself would suggest that it's all of God's people. All of his faithful people from all time considered as one great group of people uh, not just maybe the people in John's day, but all of God's people gathered together 
as a great army of God. Uh, I think that John is taking features from Old Testament texts that describe Israel as a fighting force and just kind of weaving them together into a picture. A picture that causes us to remember those passages and what they stand for. I don't know how clear all of these references were to the original readers, especially Gentiles, because they're certainly not always clear to us. Um, I get the impression that it was the kind of thing that would have been clear enough even if you didn't know all these Old Testament references because, you know, numbering your army was not just something that Israel did. But it's the kind of thing that once you scratch the surface and say, hey, this is from Zechariah, this is from Micah, that it becomes even more meaningful. Well then, verse 9, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count. So here is another group of people, and it's interesting to compare this group of people to the one that we just saw. The first group was counted, 144,000 of them. Uh, they are obviously the sons of Israel, messianically understood, Verse 4, from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Uh, they are on the earth because it says in the first three verses that the angel says, don't hurt the earth until I seal them uh, for the protection. And obviously, from the first three verses, we get the sense that there is danger coming and they are going to be facing hardship, but God is going to protect them. The second group is described a little differently. Rather than 144,000, we now have a great multitude that cannot be counted. Rather than being described as from the sons of Israel, they are from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues. They are no longer, or this group is not on the earth, they are before the throne and the Lamb in heaven. And this group is not facing persecution. We are told later on that they are the ones who have endured it and finished it. So, who is this group? Well, I want to suggest to you it's the same people. And that what we have here are before and after pictures of the same group, before hardship, after hardship, before the, the difficulty, after, prepared for conflict, victorious through conflict. I think that's the easiest explanation of who these people are. Now, there are lots of interpreters that would say, no, it's a different group. Seems to me that when you take that position that that the text becomes extremely difficult uh, to identify. The easiest answer is that it's just the same people. But notice, if you will, how they're now described. They can't be counted. And if you know your Old Testament, as soon as you hear that, you say, I know what that is. Because in Genesis 13 and Genesis 15, Genesis 17, God said over and over to Abraham that your descendants will be innumerable as the sand by the seashore and the stars in the heaven. And this is the ultimate fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham, that he has descendants, believers in God like he was, that cannot be counted. Now, if you're wondering why is it that they are counted and then they're told, and then we're told that they can't be counted. Well, the rabbis asked that question too. And uh, they had all kinds of neat answers. My suspicion is that it's the wrong question to ask. Who cares why they're told, you know, one number in, in one place and innumerable in the other? Uh, that number, as we saw, had symbolic value to identify them as the perfect Israel. And here we are told that it's not 144,000 period people. It's a great multitude of people. It's just another way of describing 
these people, so we shouldn't get hung up on numbered versus unnumbered. Uh, we are told that they come from every nation. Back in chapter 5 and verse 9, Worthy is the Lamb, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. This is the people that the Lord has redeemed. And now you'll notice that they are standing before the throne, suggesting perhaps that uh, they are no longer on the earth, but they are with the Lord, uh, and they have now received their reward. Uh, a lot has sometimes been made about the fact that they are standing. I don't see anything particularly significant about that, other than maybe uh, it's a sign of respect for the Lord, or maybe it answers the question, who was able to stand? These people have stood. They're no longer on the ground in front of their enemies, but they're standing before God. It may be something like that, uh, but that doesn't seem to me to be a real significant detail. We are told, uh, however, that they cry out, uh, or, or in verse 9, that uh, they are clothed in white robes and palm branches are in their hands. Uh, this matter of white robes uh, suggests that they are vindicated. Uh, we saw that back in chapter 3 and verse 4, that the Lord said to him who overcomes uh, that they will walk with me in white. The white robe means that they have kept their purity and they have therefore the right to stand with the uh, resurrected Jesus. Same in chapter 6 and verse 11, the saints who were under the altar to each of them was given a white robe. They had kept the faith and they were told to be patient. Well, these people are wearing the white robe as well. We're going to be told in chapter 19 and verse 8, finally at the end of the book, that the white robes are the righteous deeds of the saints. So they are obedient servants of God. And interestingly enough, even outside of uh, biblical literature, this idea of wearing white was associated with military victory. This is from uh, the book of 2 Maccabees, which talks about the war that happened in between the Old and New Testaments. Uh, we are told here that Maccabeus himself was the first to take up arms. He urged others to risk their lives with him and aid their kindred. They eagerly rushed off together, and there, while they were still near Jerusalem, a horseman appeared at their head clothed in white and brandishing weapons of gold. Uh, this idea that they are led by one in white. When a Roman emperor celebrated a triumph, he rode a white horse and wore a white toga. It was the color of victory in the ancient world. Uh, holding palm branches, we are also told. Is there any time in the Old Testament that you might uh, think about that would be that would involve palm branches? There's a particular thing the Jews had to do every year that involved palm branches, yes. Feast of Booths, yeah, Leviticus 23. On the first day you shall take the fruit of majestic trees, branches of palm trees, boughs of leafy trees, willows of the brook. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days so that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel live in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. In other words, God says, I want you to remember that you survived because of me. And the building of the booth with the palm branches and the other things was a reminder to them of God's care for them while they were in the wilderness, the place of suffering. Uh, but also in John 12, as was mentioned, uh, Jesus' triumphal entry, it is not without significance that they laid palm branches in Jesus' way. Uh, in 1st Maccabees and in 2nd Maccabees, again, this is that story of the war that happened between the Old and the New Testament. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with that story, um, the Jews had lost control of the temple. Antiochus IV had enforced Greek customs on the Jews, tried to turn their temple into a Greek temple. The Jews went to war against the Greeks and fought to get their temple back. And in 1 Maccabees 13.51, on the 23rd day of the second month in the 171st year, the Jews entered it, that is the temple, having regained the temple, they entered it with praise and palm branches and with harps and cymbals and stringed instruments, with hymns and songs, because a great enemy had been crushed. 
and removed from Israel. These people are holding palm branches. And every Jew in the ancient world knew about the Maccabean War. It, it's, it's something we don't talk about much, but they, it's kind of like, does every American know about the Revolutionary War? You betcha. Even if we don't know the details, we know that it happened. And so it was with the ancient Jews. They knew that there had been a war for independence, and they knew this story about palm branches. Second Maccabees 10.7, carrying ivy-wreathed wands and beautiful branches, fawns of palm, they offered hymns of thanksgiving to him who had given success to the purifying of his own holy place. And that's just, that goes hand in hand with those other biblical references that palm branches are a way of expressing a reminder that God has given a victory. And another clue to that is in verse 10, they cry out with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Praising God and the Lamb for the rescue and deliverance. And so the symbolism here suggests that they are no longer on the earth. They've left the scene of hardship and they hold the symbols of victory in their hands. Their victory, of course, is that they have been faithful. They have not given in to the testing and the trials that was put upon them. In Revelation 12 and verse 11, they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. That's the victory here as well. And you'll notice also that Jesus is depicted as equal in deity with God, that the Lamb sits on the throne just as much as God does. And this is part of that ongoing picture of Jesus uh, in, in which he is equal to God. Um, so to return to the scene here in chapter 7, they praise the Lord and all the angels, verse 11, are standing round the throne, the elders, the four living creatures, fall on their faces, worshiping. Where have we seen that before? Where have we seen that before? Chapters 4 and 5. We're now back to the throne scene. And... Why do we have to see the throne scene again? Because a connection is being made. The victory that these people have won is because God is in control. Remember the message of chapters 4 and 5. Don't worry. It's not like God has withdrawn. It's not like God can't do anything. God is reigning. And, and John gives us a peek into heaven to see him reigning on his throne. Well, here we see him again. And the connection is supposed to be that the reason these people have not been destroyed by their enemies is because their God is reigning. And they have been faithful to him, and they get to share in that reign. Um, one of the elders, verse 13, said to me, John says, These who are clothed in white robes, who are they and where have they come from? And John says, I have no idea. He said, well, let me tell you who they are. These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This great tribulation. There are several great tribulations mentioned in the Bible. Daniel 12 and verse 1, there is a great tribulation that may be Daniel's way of talking about the Maccabean struggle. Others identify it other ways, so we won't get into that this evening. Matthew 24, 21, Jesus said that when Rome comes to destroy Jerusalem, that there will be a great tribulation such as the world has never seen. Here, here we have uh, language again of a great tribulation. And it's not the destruction of Jerusalem. It's not the Maccabean. It's another great tribulation. Uh, that This is something that, that God's people have to go through from time to time. It is a time of judgment on a wicked nation and the testing of the faith of God's people. And we are told that they have come out of it. They have washed their robes. Uh, very quickly, Isaiah 1.18, though your sins are like uh, red like crimson, they will be as scarlet. Uh, we have Zechariah, Joshua's garments being changed to clean ones. Peter says, you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls. 1 John 1.7, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin. The same John that wrote this text writes that they have made their robes white in the blood 
of the Lamb. So by their faithfulness to the Lord, their identification with His dying, they have become the faithful ones. Uh, Leviticus 8.30, Moses took some of the anointing oil and the blood and sprinkled it on Aaron and on his garments, suggesting that these people here are priests as well. Uh, Exodus 19, when Israel is about to see God on Mount Sinai, God says, consecrate them, let them wash their garments before they come to me. And so these people are able to come to the Lord because they have washed their garments by their faithfulness. The tribulation has refined their faith, and that is what is reflected in their clothing. They're pure, they're holy, they're righteous. And so we're told about them in verse 15, For this reason they are before the throne of God. They serve Him day and night in His temple. He who sits on the throne spreads His tabernacle over them, they will hunger no longer, nor thirst any more. The sun will not beat on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. We're going to see that picture again. But John is giving us a little taste of it here. And remember that this book was written to persecuted people, people who were facing a horrible persecution. And John is saying, this is what's going to happen to those who endure. Look at how beautiful it's going to be. Look at how marvelous the end will be for those who keep themselves pure. And so this scene of victory to come is held out to give them hope to endure in the present. Uh, just very quickly here, um, this idea again of uh, the Old Testament background, Ezekiel 37, God says, I will establish my sanctuary in their midst. My tabernacle will be among them. That's what we have here. God spreading his dwelling place over his people. Uh, that same chapter, David uh, will be king over them. They will have one shepherd and I will set my sanctuary. You get that same image here. So John is using Ezekiel's image and saying here is the ultimate fulfillment in heaven. And it says that they will drink of the water of life. Uh, in Ezekiel 47, we have this picture of the ideal temple, which is a picture of the messianic age, and from it flows a water that makes the entire world come alive. And of course, wiping every tear from their eye is from Isaiah 25, that he will swallow up death, and the Lord wipes all tears from all faces. So again, John is taking pieces of pictures from the Old Testament, weaving them together into this grand picture of victory and comfort and hope for these people. Uh, that's our second bell. Does anybody have an observation, question, or comment you'd like to raise before we uh, finish tonight? All right, uh, thanks again for your good attention. You're such a wonderful audience all the time. Uh, we'll look at chapter 8 next time.